Okay, and then we'll just uh, we'll kick off at two o'clock. Um, basically, we have try and keep it within one hour. Um, I know the some a lot of slides. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have done this before, so yeah. no problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Hey. All righty. So good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of our attendees, uh, both within Vietnam and internationally, and also our panelists and expert speakers. Uh, and this is the second of our Inside Out webinar series. My name is Ran Wood, and I'm a partner of Global Business Services or GBS Vietnam, and I'll be your host today. Uh, this is uh, this webinar is part of our initiative of interactive webinars um, and it's uh, partnering with the well-known English language uh, online newsletter called Vietnam Insider. So our goal in these COVID challenge times is to bring actionable insights to our network of investors and business owners and expatriates who are either considering or already invested in Vietnam. So. Uh, Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our expert panelists. Um, we've got Mr. Ken Atkinson, and we've got uh, David Jackson, and Ms. Chan Nguyen, and Chan Min Tu, or Kathleen. So, uh, and I'll introduce them properly just before they present. So, uh, now today's agenda for anybody that, uh, again, maybe forgot uh, the, the areas that we're going to cover. Is, um, is obviously around the property market in Vietnam and which sectors and regions have the most potential for strong growth. And obviously there's many topics to cover, including the impact of COVID on the property market, um, some variations between different regions, uh, Vietnam, notable projects and transactions, relevant government initiatives and policies, um, what our experts think of the road ahead in 2021 and beyond, and the investing process for foreign investors. Because uh, again, obviously, there's some extra steps in there for for those of us that are not Vietnamese. So, <laughs> so again, I, I first of all want to thank everybody in advance, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Ken Atkinson, who is both the founder and now senior board advisor of Grant Thornton Vietnam. Uh, Ken started uh, his career with 14 years of international banking, and. Uh, uh, 
with assignments including Singapore, Hong Kong and Australia, after which he set up his own consultancy business. Uh, with over 42 years of emerging market experience and 40 years in Asia, uh, Ken has undertaken a lot of uh, corporate finance transactions in emerging markets worldwide. And Ken has been working and living almost exclusively in Cam uh, Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos uh, during the last 30 years and founded Grand Thornton Vietnam, uh, which is part of the, a member firm of Grand Thornton International. And his work obviously include financial advisory transaction support uh, and other senior roles in capacity building projects funded by multilateral and bilateral donors, advising clients on project appraisal, debt finance, loan restructuring, corporate restructuring and equity funding. And I have to say, it's a privilege to have Ken here. He's one of the doyens of the expat, expat community. So uh, Ken's going to open us up with uh, not just the property market perspectives, but also some general perspectives on Vietnam. Thank you very much, Ken. Yeah, okay. And then you want to share your screen, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no share. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, you're sharing your screen. So I'm sorry for that. Let me go back to the main. Okay. Just to kill myself you. Sorry. Um, you've got me now. Just start, just a new share, I think. Okay. All right. Now we'll start, start to share again. Okay. Uh -huh. Share screen. And where did we say it was? No. This one here. Yeah. Okay, bingo. Oh, dear. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I think, yes, I have unmuted. Um, that's why I, that's why I came so Ron could help me. I'm a <laughs> bit challenged when it comes to IT. Um, anyway, so I'm going to kick off with uh, a bit, just a brief overview of the economy 2020 and where I see things going 2021 uh, in terms of, uh, of Vietnam. I'll talk a little bit about the tourism and hospitality sector because that's the sector I guess that uh, I spend uh, most of my time involved in. Um, and then um, I'm looking at the, um, yeah, what's going on and what I see for, for 2021. Um, no, I can't see. Conflicts, conflicts. All right, okay. Can I get rid of this? Sorry. Yes. Can I put that at the top? Right, okay. Okay, so. I mean, last year we, we had another pretty record performance in 2019 from the, from the economy. We had uh, record uh, export growth. We, we had a good trade balance. We had record at FDI. Um, we had reasonable credit growth and uh, foreign exchange reserves were, were creeping up, um, but still on a, on a level of about three months, three months imports. Um, and uh, the forecast for, for 2020 was, was looking very good um, as of uh, January. Um, and then of course, um, COVID hit. So whilst the impact has been pretty significant on Vietnam, we are one of the best or the top five performing economies worldwide. Um, and certainly uh, the best performing economy in, in Asia. Um, for the first nine months, we had uh, growth of 2.1% uh, that we had growth. Um, we had growth in, in exports, which were for the first nine months, 202 billion US dollars, was growth of about 4, 4%. We had a, an increased trade balance. Um, and I suspect 
that was partly due to uh, lower imports of capital equipment that uh, was being used to or, or going into new uh, FDI projects um, because there's been a slowdown in, in actual um, mobilization of those projects. FDI stood up fairly well um, for the first nine months. It was at just over 19 billion. Um, it's about 10, 10% down on, uh, on last year. Um, and CPI was being controlled well under 4%, which is the, the government target. Um, banks, of course, whilst the government would like them to lend more to keep the economy moving, um, they're already very conscious of uh, non-performing loans and bad debts. And therefore, credit growth has kind of been running at a, an extremely low level of, of 6%. Um, but foreign exchange reserves, on the other hand, have uh, shown significant growth. Um, and at the end of September, we're at 92 billion, which is a, a record for the country. So for the full year 2020, government is projecting 2.6 to 2.8% GDP growth, which will be would be a good, a good performance. Um, exports are looking as though they're going to be 5 to 10% higher than last year. So 275, trade balance 10 to 15 billion. F F FDI, um, sorry, that figure should be um, 36 to 38, not 16 to 18. And uh, again, CPI under 4%. Uh, credit growth will creep up a little bit, hopefully, in the last quarter. Um, and foreign exchange reserves projected to, to reach uh, 100 billion, which they've never done before. Um, sorry, can It's not working on the... Okay. Yeah. Um, so for globally, you know, many, many countries have entered recession. Uh, so global growth is, is going to be at a minimal. Um, stimulus packages have created, well, obviously they've helped the economy and the people that uh, have lost jobs and companies that have been forced to, to close or lay off staff. Uh, but they have created massive debt burdens for the developed economies, which people are going to be paying for for, for, for years to come. It has caused companies to take a closer look and examine their supply chains. Um, and I think Vietnam will be a standout beneficiary of that in 2021 and beyond, um, partly because of the superb way that they've actually con controlled and contained the spread of COVID-19 within the country. Um, and uh, then they will also have been benefiting and will, I think, continue to benefit uh, even though we may see a change of uh, administration in the US, uh, but the trade tensions with China, I don't think are going to disappear that quickly. Um, so if we look at um, forecasts for 2021, crystal ball, but uh, government is projecting GDP growth of six to six and a half percent. IMF, 7% um, and then the World Bank, ADB, in the six six to seven percent range the outlier when i first saw the goldman sachs estimate of 8.1 i thought somebody there had been smoking mm -hmm. uh, but um, then hsbc came out a little bit later actually a couple of weeks ago with a very similar number of 8.1 percent but um uh, i i prefer to stick with the with the government target do expect exports to continue increasing expect to see foreign exchange reserves continuing to increase. Um, trade balance will probably shrink a little bit, um, again, because of, of FDI and the, um, the imports of uh, capital equipment for factories and the like. Um, CPI has been well controlled in the last few years and I expect it to continue at below 4%. four um, and I think FDI could well creep up um, to a higher level in the 40 billion range. And I say that partly because of the continued move of uh, manufacturing out of, out of China into, into Vietnam. 
but also um, because of the impact or starting to see benefits from the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement and also the uh, CPTPP. Um, looking at, at tourism and hospitality, well, we had a record year last year with 18, 18, billion, uh, 18 million foreign visitor arrivals and 85 million domestic tourists. Um, but this year, because of the impact of COVID, um, we're going to be lucky to see 4 million foreign visitors. Uh, we had 3.6, 3.7 in the first quarter. Um, and actually we had 1.9 million in January alone. So you can, you know, see the trend there. Um, domestic travelers, uh, well, we stopped traveling for, we stopped from traveling for a number of weeks. Um, reopened at the end of, of April and uh, there was a lot of uh, pent up demand. Um, but then unfortunately we had a second outbreak of COVID in Da Nang in July um, and that really set things, set things back. So for 2020, I don't really expect to see more than maximum 40 million domestic travelers. Uh, total revenue from the sector has gone down from about 30 billion to, um, well, it's going to end up around um, somewhere between 7.6 and 10, 10 billion. Um, city hotels in particular, the five and four star, are, are suffering very badly, seeing occupancy of under, under 10%. In fact, they're lucky if they get 5%. Um, that is leading, obviously, to, to rate discounts and um, similar, really, situations in, in resort locations. Apart, the ones that seem to be surviving better are the ones that are within driving distance of the main cities like Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Um, Ho Cham, for example, where there is a great golf course and casino hotel. Uh, they're, they're getting up to 90% plus occupancy on a Saturday and 70% on a Friday and 60% on a Sunday. So um, they're, they're doing quite well at weekends, but they're in very low occupancy uh, during, during the week. Uh, so my forecast for 2021 is, um, well, as soon as Vietnam starts to open borders, um, but one in terms of business travel and they're starting to to do that but uh, there's been a few stops and starts but uh, foreign experts are being allowed in uh, and i would expect to see some relaxation in business travel um, but i think overall my my prediction is that business travel will suffer a major major um, decline i think companies have realized or will realize when they start to do look at their annual figures um, and doing their budgets that uh, all this travel that didn't take place this year goes straight to the bottom line. And if you've got a lot of um, people in your company traveling, um, it's a great opportunity to, to reduce costs. And people have seen that you can manage with Zoom. You don't have to go to meetings. I mean, some meetings, of course, you, you really do need to go to, but a lot of our travel, mine included, was because, yeah, always get that adrenaline rush when somebody talks about going, going on a trip and going for meetings and getting on a plane. Um, so I, I think we're in danger of, you know, business travel probably declining, maybe even as, as much as uh, 40 to 50%. Um, and I don't think it's going to be coming back to pre-COVID levels till 2024, 25. I think tourism is, is different. I think it will bounce back quicker. Um, there's a lot of pent up demand. There's been a lot of surveys done of, of uh, you know, tourists in, in China. Vietnam is one of their favorite destinations. And uh, uh, interestingly, Vietnam was the, um, the fourth most searched destination on, on, on Agoda. Uh, they released that information about three or four weeks ago. Um, domestic travel, I think, will will bounce back, uh, but I don't think it'll get to, again, pre-COVID levels next year, but 50 to 60 million. Um, and, well, I had a pessimistic forecast of six to eight million for uh, foreign visitor arrivals, but uh, the Prime Minister released a statement on the 3rd of November, uh, basically saying that, uh, well, it was like 
more of an apology, but we're not going to open the borders because the safety of our people is more important than the uh, the economic impact of, of, of allowing foreign tourists. So I don't think we're going to see foreign tourists before at least the second quarter next year. And uh, that my pessimistic forecast might even turn out to be a little bit optimistic. Um, so yeah, David and Tran will be able to talk more coherently than me on, on the actual real estate side, but there are many properties that are closed and probably many that won't reopen. Um, there are properties galore for sale at the smaller end or, or mini hotel end. Um, we're seeing some five-star hotels on the market now um, and expect to, I, I think, you know, come the turn of the year, uh, we'll start to see more three and four-star hotel properties uh, on the market. Um, the problem is with Vietnamese sellers, they um, don't understand distress um, and uh, they don't look at the economic values of properties or, or shall I say the cash flow value of properties. They look at land values um, and many of them don't seem to think that land values have changed from the, the pre pre COVID times. Um, we see interest from overseas buyers, but uh, until pricing gets realistic, uh, I don't think we'll see too many transactions completed. Um, I won't take up more time, but for those of you that get the uh, copy of the presentation, there's information on, on Grant Thornton. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Ken. I think uh, that's a great setting of a scene. Um, you know, again, no, uh, uh, no disputing the fact that the tourism sector is perhaps the most adversely affected by this whole COVID situation. And um, uh, yeah, I think uh, any countries that have performed as well as Vietnam in terms of restricting the, uh, uh, the occurrence of COVID uh, are very keen to protect that. So I'm not surprised that the, uh, the Prime Minister is uh, saying, don't get your hopes up that we're going to get a flood of international tourists. Um, so, so I think the, uh, uh, it's okay, I'll fix that in a second here. Just let me, uh, before we uh, uh, go on, I just uh, wanted to introduce uh, David Jackson, who's our second speaker today. And David is the Chief Executive Officer of Colliers International in Vietnam. And uh, David uh, is managing the operational aspects of the organization, along with setting a strategic vision and goals. Um, he also maintains his own portfolio of major clients and um, he's got, as all of our speakers do, a broad and diverse level of expertise in uh, managing businesses and capital markets and transaction management, valuations and advisory in the property area uh, with over 18 years experience in commercial real estate and management services. Um, and he's advising a lot of international, regional and local clients. Uh, David arrived in Vietnam in 2008, not as long as Ken. Uh, none of us have been here that long except for maybe our local uh, speakers, but uh, David's worked for a number of major occupier accounts and been an advisor, a primary advisor to large scale organisations such as Recorporation and Kumo Asiana, as well as undertaken a variety of roles within Colliers International. So uh, I won't take many more time, but I'll hand over to David and, uh, you know, again, uh, looking forward to uh, throwing a, a few more questions coming from the audience. By all means, submit them through the Q&A button and we'll try and deal with those as they come along. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, Ran, uh, thank you very much uh, for today. First of all, before I start, um, you know, thanks very much to GBS Services and Vietnam Insider um, for hosting this today, the Vietnam's property market trends and economic conditions. And also uh, just to the other panelists, it's, it's a great honor to be uh, obviously with Ken, uh, Huynh and Tran um, itself. I, I, I'm very proud to be part of that. Very experienced people. Um, so without going any further, let me just share my screen. Uh, if that's okay. So let me just click on here. And hopefully you can see this now. Um, so anyway, first of all, uh, if you give me a bit of latitude, let me just talk a little bit about COVID. Obviously, um, there are lots of people talking about COVID and webinars and COVID, and it's affected a lot of people worldwide. Um, but I guess the, the, the first part 
is just to see that actually to look at perspective, you know, there's, there's 46 million confirmed cases uh, as of uh, the 3rd of November around the world, and, and of which about 1.2 million people have died um, around the world. And it's affected lots of people financially and obviously changed uh, a lot of the way that we um, uh, behave in, in, in life. Um, but where does, where does that, that come for in case of Vietnam? Well, look, Vietnam actually uh, relatively has done extremely well. So when you look at the figures, um, you know, in, in terms of the region, um, obviously, um, you know, Vietnam is a, a, a 95 million people. And so out of that, just uh, having 34 confirmed deaths um, at the moment, uh, as of the third, uh, uh, you know, 62 days without community infection. Um, so Vietnam have been very good in controlling the situation. Um, but obviously it's affect different sectors. And one of those, um, obviously real estate, people, finances, as Ken was talking about, uh, one of them is, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is the retail sector. Obviously, um, you know, food and beverage, outlets, restaurants, nightclubs uh, were forced to, to close, uh, um, you know, to stop the spread of the virus. Uh, international travel was limited, which uh, as Ken was talking about, affecting uh, tourism and, and, and the World Bank uh, is sort of suggesting that um, it could be plunging the global economy into the worst recession since World War II. Um, now, hopefully that's not the case. Um, and, and looking at that, you know, how does that affect uh, developers and other stuff where they, they, they are maybe a bit more cautious these days uh, post-COVID? Um, so this is a, this is a graph by uh, Politico, um, just to kind of put into perspective about um, offsetting public health outcomes and uh, economic outcomes. And as you see from this uh, in the top right hand corner, Vietnam's um, uh, far uh, controlled the spread uh, and, and is looking at a much better outcome uh, than, than previously predicted. Um, in addition to that, Vietnam is also um, looking like um, it, it, people are starting to look at it a lot more seriously because of the, the effectiveness of the government here, the stability of the government here, and also the control um, of spread of the virus and, and how that impacted the people here. So um, actually doing relatively well. Uh, just a few of the clips here. Um, you know, there are, there's still a lot of newly established businesses coming. Uh, Vietnam, they believe in the Southeast region uh, in terms of uh, GDP is probably looking at the only positive growth uh, in terms of the region. So um, people are, are looking at the economy and, and they're actually seeing that, that it, things are looking to improve. So just to go into the various markets, um, but before I start, the, probably the best thing to note about Vietnam is it doesn't matter really what market segment you're in, whether it be retail, office, industrial. Um, at the moment, every single market sector is in demand and undersupplied in Vietnam. And so there is a lot of growth potential to happen. There's a lot of performance development to happen. To put this in perspective, starting off with the office market, um, actually um, there's about a, just over a million, million and five um, uh, net uh, square meters of space in office space in Ho Chi Minh City uh, for, for a population of around about um, 15 million uh, people. Uh, this is, this is uh, it needs to develop and it needs to grow a lot more space, whether that's uh, in, in the CBD in terms of office space um, or whether that's um, external outside uh, of, of the CBD are growing um, uh, uh, suburban uh, settlements for office. Uh, you can see this in, in the fact that um, the vacancy levels are extremely low. Um, there, is, there is need to develop more office space. Um, there is need to develop um, different types of office space with co-working space and, uh, and, and, and sharing. And the same goes up in Hanoi. Um, again, in Hanoi, um, vacancies are extremely low. Um, and so what does this mean? Well, during this year, during COVID, because um, there has been some change in movement, there has been a movement from people because people are working from home, um, but the landlords still have to maintain their levels and it's, it's still very much a landlord's market because there isn't uh, enough supply. So actually in terms of the rentals going down or impacting impact, impact by COVID, um, this hasn't really changed that much. The landlords haven't really offered that many incentives or 
Uh, the only things that they might have done in this market is offer furlough of rental um, to help with cash flow, but um, they still need to cover the rental from that. There's been little movement in incentives, um, you know, for, for office space. Um, so, so what does this mean? So just because of the development cycle of Vietnam and where it's at at the moment, um, you know, office rental rates are still pretty high. Um, in the building that I'm currently um, talking to at Deutsches House, the average rental rate there is 65 US dollars a square meter. Um, you know, that there, there are people that are looking for um, larger scale size space. Um, and outside of the CBD to, to account for good rental rates. So there is a movement, uh, again, with increased infrastructure uh, for people to move away from the CBD uh, at the moment. Um, and they're, they're moving from uh, centralized big offices to, to, to satellite offices. Uh, in addition, because of COVID, because of uncertainty and because of, because of compliance, uh, there has been a, a growth in the amount of uptake uh, for serviced offices or co-working spaces. Uh, with companies needing to have contingency seats um, while while they while they battle the virus, um, and also um, because of uncertain uh, economic times, people want a bit of flexibility uh, going on that. Um, in terms of the companies, uh, normally people sign in Vietnam office rental rates uh, for two or three years, uh, with another two or three years to follow from that. Um, but people are looking for a, a, maybe a bit term shorter commitment um, and the landlords are being a bit flexible with, with that um, so that, that, that people can maintain uh, and get control over their rent. Um, so what, what does this mean? So a lot of the projects that, that were under construction, um, some of them have been delayed, um, especially in the South. There's a lot of projects that are delayed uh, and, and there's a, the, the current government is looking to develop in the North a lot more. Uh, you can see this in the delay on the metro line uh, in Ho Chi Minh City compared to Hanoi. Um, but you can also see it in terms of the projects. There's still very lit little amount of projects that are going to come into the market in the next couple of years. Um, in Hanoi, uh, some of the projects are a lot larger in terms of scale than Saigon. Um, but but the, the outlook for the office market is that it's still very much a landlord's market uh, with control going forward. So here we go on to one of the difficult ones. This is, is, this is the retail market. Now, obviously over the last year, there has been restrictions on food and beverage. Um, there's been uh, a, a, a movement away from um, big shopping centers uh, where obviously COVID might spread. Uh, and this has had a, 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 an impact on um, the, the fact that some, some food and beverage outlets can't open or cinemas are closed, um, which has affected the rental rates. Now, some landlords have um, helped with this and, and they've um, either uh, helped in terms of lowering rental rates or, or service charge for that, or in some cases, um, they furloughed the rental rates to cover a later date. Um, other companies have, which you can see in a lot of the, uh, the, the, the commercial shop fronts, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of businesses have closed and, and it, it looks like they might not open for, uh, again, some of the businesses. However, um, in terms of occupancy, the occupancies have still maintained in the shopping centers um, where there has been support from the landlord. Um, there is potentially um, growth that's happening. And there's a movement where space that might be available uh, now because of uh, a tenant uh, deciding to discontinue operations has been taken over by a bigger operator. Uh, you can see this in the change of style from um, uh, the Parkson kind of uh, style, which is five floors retail unit, which um, have now uh, looked at partnershiping with uh, Uniqlo, who have taken over a large amount of their space uh, across Vietnam. You can see other operators taking this opportunity to expand. Um, in addition, so where, where's this going in terms of uh, the trends? Uh, well, first of all, there's without the tourism coming on, tourist spending, local spending is still um, the priority. Food and beverage is still the, the, the biggest um, market in terms of retail. And there's a movement, obviously, with the current environment into healthcare, wellness, um, cleaning products rising. And there's a natural shift with technology that is occurring anyway before COVID, which is the e-commerce, the rise in e-commerce uh, that is happening. You only need to stand outside of an office building in Vietnam to see the amount of deliveries that are coming in. Uh, if you look at the statistics for the government here, um, the e-commerce market penetration is actually quite low. Um, 
in 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 effect, actually, it's quite high, but the government don't know how to measure some of the e-commerce deliveries because there um, there's products sold on Facebook and there's people that aren't necessarily paying tax on their products um, to monitor. So actually, the government's e-commerce penetration is actually quite low, but in, in reality, it's actually quite high. Believe it or not. So there's a few notable retail projects. Again, um, what we're looking at here is, is um, some of the big operators, you obviously Vin Com expanding in their footprint across Vietnam. Um, Vin uh, Vin Mart actually, uh, Masan um, who bought Vin Mart last year or a percentage of Vin Mart, they're looking at closing down a few shopping centers, but as a whole, there's a movement to these big shopping mall and shopping mall outlets. You can see this with Lotte expanding, Vin Group expanding, um, Big C uh, is also changing and relaunching their brand to a brand called B. Um, and, and in addition, Aeon are looking at uh, expanding out across Vietnam as well. So there's a there's a big movement to consolidate retail in some big outlets. Residential. So looking at residential, um, actually uh, residential, you would think with people being a bit conservative and saving money and with uncertain times, that they, they might have affected the, the, the residential market in terms of sales. Um, actually, the only effect that's kind of been this year, the sales price is still maintained fairly high uh, in, in, the, in the new project launches. The only thing that really occurred is that some of the project launches were uh, delayed uh, and we're expected to be at the end of the year. And that's just so that people are joining in a public space. But actually, the price is still there. People are still buying property. They're still investing in real estate. Um, and they're still moving um, in that direction. Um, now, the trends of them, obviously, the unfortunate size with, with a lack of tourism, a lack of people coming in, um, obviously the, the, the people that are buying residential properties to, to get a, a, a rental yield from them, or they're looking at an investment with Airbnb, obviously with the, the limited tourism coming on, that's going to affect the rental rates. Um, the rental rates have decreased, um, there are uh, now uh, very good deals in the market in terms of rental rates that the, the landlords are trying to maintain um, their, their tenant. And as a result, they're offering decrease in rental rates. So if you're, if you're renting in both Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City or Da Nang, that there are actually a lot of good deals that can, you can be had by now. And, it, and, and hopefully when the international travels um, uh, resume and uh, the corridors open up, um, I think the rental rates will, will, will improve going up. Um, so local sales still holding steady um, with some distressed deals in the market, but actually still very limited. As Ken mentioned, there's a, a value on people or they're holding firm on their on their prices of their properties at the moment. So where, where, where do you invest in real estate in Vietnam? Um, so the first one is obviously, if you can afford it, close to the central business district. That's where the highest land rates, the highest cost of land are, and there's projects that are uh, now selling at a premium. Uh, there, there's a, a project in Saigon, for example, the Spirit of Saigon, that's selling at a extremely high rates at the moment. Um, and there's a development of a lot of facilities coming close to the city centers in Hanoi, uh, where in the west uh, side of Hanoi, where they're, they're developing modern facilities, hospitals, international schools. Um, but there is also a movement where, the, with improvements of infrastructure, um, I think there's a plan to, to improve the, the, the roadways to Dalat, for example, uh, which will half the time to get to Dalat. Um, obviously, with new transport links and things like that, there is a lot of suburban locations that should be looked at now uh, where the, the land price is increasing rapidly um, and, and, and should be invested in. Um, so the industrial market, I won't spend too much on this because obviously um, uh, Quinn will talk about this, uh, I think, in a lot more detail. Um, but just like I mentioned before, um, there it is undersupplied and over demanded at the moment. Uh, industrial space, uh, along with um, M&A space and uh, investment, is, is probably the most looked at space at the moment. There is a movement to logistics. There's a movement to um, warehousing um, that, that, uh, and delivery. Um, for these e-commerce platforms that is happening. Um, in terms of some of the land prices uh, in industrial real estate over the last two years, they, they've almost doubled in value uh, where the demand is there. And because they've doubled in value in terms of the land price, uh, there is a change in style in the industrial warehousing as well, where they 
are now gone to two tier warehousing structures to take advantage of the cost of land uh, and the different style of that. So <clears throat> one of the good things about the industrial market is obviously, um, and depending on the outcome of the US elections, uh, is the US uh, China trade uh, issues. There is also um, the European um, trade agreements and also, uh, as Ken said, um, the ratified uh, other agreements with, with the TPP. Um, and, it, and it looks like when you look at Vietnam and improvements to infrastructure and its location and stability, uh, there is even uh, companies like Japan at the moment are, I think the Japan government put two, 287 million uh, in subsidies for Japanese com companies to relocate out of uh, China and, and Hong Kong and, and uh, move to alternative uh, countries, one of which being Vietnam, the other one being Indonesia. Um, Price is holding steady with COVID. Again, just like the office space, there is uh, limited locations that people can have. Uh, the prices are going up for, for the, the, the key movements are industrial. And the government is also stepping in to help relocate. Um, that they've rezoned a lot of the industrial spaces um, to make sure that uh, high tech centers and logistics centers and the more polluting industries and, and textile industries are moved away from the city center. Um, warehouse demand is increasing as people need stocks for the deliveries um, and the e-commerce platform. Uh, and, and in some cases, some of the regional areas have, have decided to maybe stay away from um, uh, logistics centers and things like that because of technology. They realize that they need other industries that have, that can hire people and, and, and uh, get more people uh, on the ground here rather than um, logistics, which are factories made up with machines. Um, so just slightly moving on, so where, where are we at as a whole? Um, you know, obviously Ken spoke about the hospitality and the issues with that. Obviously there's issues um, with retail, as I mentioned, uh, but quite frankly, COVID is kind of uh, it's under control. Travel bubbles will be happening. And, and as Ken said, maybe by quarter two next year, it will be, um, there'll be a bit of movement on that. The government has given financial packages and they have offered assistance to employers and employees in terms of furloughing and paying taxes. Um, so Vietnam is in a fairly good space in terms of that it's ready for a rebound. There again, there's the trade, the trade agreements as well that are, are gonna offer benefits and improvements for Vietnam and open up for other com companies and countries coming in. And infrastructure is improving. There are, there are more infrastructure happening, obviously with change in infrastructure, this is one of the biggest limiters to growth uh, in terms of uh, uh, development. Um, you have more deep water ports underway. Uh, you have more airports that are under construction uh, in terms of what's going on, better transport lines. All of this will help uh, in terms of development. Um, you know, Ken talked a little bit about this, but, you know, just to kind of finish up and leave on a point, you know, Vietnam is ready. In the time that I've been here, there's been a few ups and downs in terms of Vietnam and development and growth. Um, but com comparatively in the region, I think Vietnam's in a very strong position. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if I can leave on one point, I'll say, is Vietnam the right time to invest in now? Yes, depending on the market sector, but, but clearly um, compared to a lot of the other countries, they're gonna be looking to uh, look at uh, investment in other markets and Vietnam is clearly a clear player in this one and it's in time to invest is now. So there we go, uh, fast recovering from COVID. It's a leading growth in ASEAN. FDI will increase uh, positively. It's a, it's a place where 65% uh, of the population are under 30, they have more disposable income. Um, you know, now, now's the time to invest and grow. Uh, in comparison, a lot of people say that Vietnam's maybe 10, 15 years uh, behind China in terms of its development and growth. Um, in the last 10 or 15 years in China, there's a lot of people that made a lot of money. And so, uh, you know, if you're going to invest, I, I, I would invest in Vietnam at the moment. Thanks very much for the talk. Uh, let me stop my screen and I'll, I'll pass back to Ran uh, uh, and the other panelists. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, David. That's uh, so many insights. I think uh, all of our viewers would have found that super helpful. And I've got maybe the toughest question of the day for you, which is, what do you think uh, how long can some of these um, holdout owners or landlords um, last before you see a change in maybe some of the attitudes, particularly in those urban markets where you said 
the retail landlords or, or some of the hoteliers are just hanging in there thinking, well, this will come and go, Vietnam's doing so well. But, you know, the third wave is well and truly underway in most of the developed markets. But, and maybe Vietnam can uh, avoid that. But, uh, but I, just in terms of your experience over the years and being in Vietnam since 2008, how long do you think uh, before you see some revision in those, those very kind of robust attitudes that they have? Yeah, so I, I think look one of the one of the things as a as a, a, a foreign consultant here about about uh, uh, Vietnam and the Vietnamese people as a whole, um, you know, uh, I guess that 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 they are extremely adaptable, quick, um, you know, and and uh, obviously with a lot of them, uh, it's it's pivot or perish in terms of the the way that they're uh, acting. Um, I think some of some of the um, developers, um, you know, they have a much more longer plan. Uh, here, um, there's a lot of funds that uh, that are here for a long term, and this is just part of that. Uh, you know, um, ten years ago it was uh, H1N1. Uh, uh, before that, it was it was Asian flu uh, or an economic crisis. So I think you know a lot of developers that are investing or invest did in Vietnam. They have a, a much more long term view. Um, one of the things probably that I would say is with hotels, I think I think that a lot of them don't have a great deal of choice. And so at the moment they're, they're conserving their bottom line in terms of business. What I have seen though, and, and if, you, if you read the news over the last couple of days, there are certain banks that are, are kind of uh, pulling back. Uh, there, was, there was mention in the news of CT Group and, and uh, Vintian calling back some of the loans on that. Um, you know, so I think that there is something changing. A lot of the developers already have a good relationship with the banks, financial institutions, um, and so a lot of them are, are kind of have the ability to delay payment. I, I think, um, and, and, and obviously we've got a kind of incentives from the government. So, so I, I, to answer your question, I think it depends on the market sector you're in. Um, I think a lot of people that are involved in that are, are for the long-term investors, um, and, and so I, I think it's just part of maybe conserving what they're up to at the moment, and, and then hoping that things develop and, and improve. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, rapidly, you know. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't know the future, but but uh, yeah, crystal ball. Uh, well said, it, anyway. It's very it's very positive in Vietnam in a way. So much better than yeah. some of the other. Pers personally, coming from the UK, uh, uh, Vietnam's the place I would rather be at the moment. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. All right, on to our next speaker. Uh, obviously, focused uh, on that very hot sector. Ms. Chan Quinn is the Deputy CEO of VW Industrial Development, joint stock company. Uh, she oversees uh, VW Industrial uh, Investment Division and the company's new investment strategies to assist its growth plans in Vietnam. Uh, with over 25 years of real estate experience, uh, with the majority of this covering investments in Vietnam in different sectors. Prior to joining uh, VW, she was the SVP of uh, Logis LLC, a Southeastern Asia hospitality platform, head of M&A at Maple Tree Vietnam, head of sales and investment at JLL and CBRE. So yet another property guru, thank heavens. Uh, thanks to Mr. Chan, uh, please take it away. Thanks Ran for the introduction. Let me just share my screen uh, on the presentation. Um, today I'll purely be focusing on um, the industrial market. And I think a lot of the first part, um, David and Ken has already uh, covered, particularly for the economy. So hold on a sec. Okay. So um, in terms of the impact of COVID for the industrial market, what we've seen so far is actually uh, Vietnam has been still very uh, positive, keeping positive momentum. In the first eight months of this year, uh, we've seen an increase of 2.2% uh, in industrial uh, production index. Uh, if we compare the numbers from last year, I think process and manufacturing is only less than the 10% growth compared to 2019, but it is still very positive at the moment with 3.7%. Uh, GDP uh, for Vietnam forecasted for 2019 uh, for post-COVID is 4.8% based on PWC's numbers. If we compare that to our peers in the region, I think Vietnam still uh, remains on top. If I move to the next slide, I think this is the reason why Vietnam has been such a hot, 
difficult topic uh, for the industrial sector uh, in the news recently. Uh, the first thing is, if you look at uh, geographically, Vietnam is very well positioned with a long coastline, a uh, lot of key gateways uh, to supporting global supply chain. We also have China bordering us in the north um, and on the east, on the west side, we have Laos, Thailand and Cambodia as well. So I think in terms of connectivities to key gateways and other countries in the region, Vietnam geographically is positioned in, in, the, in a great uh, place. In addition to that, um, some of the key fundamentals here for Vietnam is that it has a very young and abundant population. Uh, currently it's at 97 million uh, population and it's estimated to reach 120 million by uh, 2050. Uh, in addition to that, um, the large working workforce age group is over 44% of the population. Um, if we look at the statistics in terms of the monthly average salary for Vietnam, we're less than 50% of the cost of China per month for the average manufacturing workers. So this is actually poised to be a very good alternative for many of the manufacturers and also uh, key uh, supply chain companies looking at setting up um, locations in Vietnam. In addition to that, uh, I think David had touched on it uh, briefly is to do with Vietnam's pro-business policy. Uh, you can see that the government has actually signed 13 FTAs already. And uh, of that, uh, 12 of them are already effective with the most recent being the, the European Free Trade Agreement that was signed uh, in 2019. And there's uh, still a number of further free trade agreement under negotiation as well. So this actually has really put Vietnam into a very key uh, highlight spot. Uh, and you can see one of the wordings that I've uh, taken out here from Home Depot uh, from the US is that, you know, we're seeing a lot of suppliers moving out of China. And I, I would see that uh, a lot of the manufacturing are not just completely closing down and moving out of China, but they're also setting up a footprint in Vietnam to de-risk uh, their supply chain uh, connectivity as well. So with one of the largest one that we've seen this year uh, from the US who actually supplies 80% of the product to Home Depot is TTI. So TTI is, is a US company that's based in China. Uh, they're relocating the whole production uh, over to Vietnam and will be re relocated into Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, with that, we'll bring a whole group of um, their vendors and supply chain uh, suppliers to Vietnam. Uh, we're aware of this because they're also leasing uh, from some of our uh, locations at the moment while they're waiting for their main uh, production factory to be built and constructed. So, you know, in terms of the advantages that Vietnam has is that we're seeing that, you know, it's not no longer just, you know, comparing Vietnam as uh, a em emerging market, but I think we're up there in terms of our uh, competition, in terms of our preferred destination for many of the manufacturers. Um, if you look at my next slide here, I think uh, what I wanted to show you is that how we look at the industrial development in Vietnam is that there are certain concentration of different sectors uh, throughout the country. We see a lot more of the electronics, the automobile, the high tech manufacturing located in the north. Uh, we have a lot of the um, suppliers for Apple products uh, all located in the Buttonin area. Uh, and also Hanoi and Haiphong area, and also Samsung being located up in the north as well. The north typically tends to have slightly better infrastructure. Um, David touched on the various highways and um, expressways that are being built. Um, we can see that in comparison, the north area has much better infrastructure uh, compared to the south. Well, the South, most of what we're seeing in terms of manufacturers and su uh, supply chains coming through are more focused on the textile, garment, apparel, and fabrications, plastic, and rubber production. So I think uh, with the South, there are certain provinces that also dominate in terms of attracting uh, these uh, manufacturers uh, and companies and FDI. 
I will go into that a little bit later in terms of the sectors between the north and the south and how we look at different provinces based on connectivity and infrastructure development. In terms of what has Vietnam done to create uh, more favourable measures for uh, companies during the COVID period in 2020 is actually the government actually has helped to create certain tax payment defer payments for companies uh, with regards to VAT uh, submissions or certain exemptions also on penalties. Um, they've also reduced corporate tax cut as well uh, by 30% for those companies that actually have a revenue that doesn't exceed 8.8 8, 8, um, million. And also what they've also done is actually created incentives for employers. Um, in terms of allowing them if they meet certain criteria, to get financing from the bank at zero interest and also uh, late, contrib late contribution of 50% in terms of the social security payments that they have to pay for their employees as well to sort of help uh, unburden the load for the companies uh, during the COVID period. In terms of the industrial market itself, um, what we've seen in terms of pricing, this is an overall blended average uh, of a number of provinces. You'll see that in certain areas, the, the rent can be quite extreme, uh, a wide range. So overall, if we compare it by country, Vietnam still on a land rental base per square meter per term is still relatively much lower compared to their peers in, in the region in Southeast Asia. On average, uh, we're looking at about $92 uh, nationwide per square meter. While if we would actually break it up into the North um, and the South regions, we're seeing that the North has much higher occupancy um, and there's much bigger demand. And this is mainly due to the limited supply that's actually been released in terms of industrial parkland that's available. And we're seeing prices in the North ranging from $65 to $260, depending on the, uh, the location and the province. Uh, for the South, we do have much uh, a slightly lower occupancy, um, but this is mainly due to the fact that it includes uh, regions like um, the Long An area, which is a new area uh, where we're seeing uh, additional uh, industrial park. But if you're looking at Ho Chi Minh City itself, uh, occupancy is nearly like full. Uh, close to the 95%. So in the South, we're seeing prices range from $80 to $300 per square meter. And this is the asking price. Um, this is the price that you will be looking at in terms of secondary transaction or get buying directly from uh, the developer for the land plot if manufacturers are looking to come in and, and set foot uh, in these locations. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail on the specific areas where we're seeing uh, the rapid growth and demand in terms of uh, the, the regions within Vietnam and where you, we would look at to invest. Um, for the north, we see that the key, three key province with the highest demand and inquiries are coming from, based on our inquiry level from our tenants, uh, coming in for Hanoi, Bắc Ninh and Haiphong. Um, these three companies itself, sorry, uh, these three companies itself, uh, three province itself are the key areas, mainly because Hanoi, we're seeing a lot of demand from the 3PLs and the e-commerce uh, players. Uh, for Bucknan, we're seeing a lot of the high-tech uh, companies uh, coming in and electronics company, companies coming in. Haiphong, uh, a, a key gateway with the, the port, uh, we're seeing a lot of companies looking for warehousing space and also to cater to the uh, to provide uh, tech products and equipments to those queen bees nearby. So uh, other key areas that we're seeing that will be uh, a hot spot going forward for the next 12 months will be the Bakzang area, which is an expansion. Bakzang used to be part of uh, Bucknan. Um, but Yang is, is an expansion and we have Foxcom there. Um, so you'll see that there will be further growth and price increases in the Buck Yang region uh, moving forward. Uh, as you can see, I think on the map here, we've indicated some of the areas where BW have uh, facilities where we've got uh, RBF. Most of them you'll see that we actually um, 
develop and pick locations along key expressways and uh, key gateways where there's good accessibility to ports to establish uh, residential urban development, uh, particularly for the warehousing uh, customers. If you go to the next slide, um, this is a little bit on the south. In the south, I think the three key um, location um, that a lot of the investors have been looking at is Ho Chi Minh City, Binh Yul, which is a very, very well established uh, industrial area, uh, probably one of the very first uh, area that's actually really welcome and attracted a lot of uh, foreign investors, and also at Dong Nai. So this is towards the uh, north part of Ho Chi Minh City. So Dong Nai will be also the area where the new Long Tan uh, Airport will be built and infrastructure actually movement in terms of development is moving towards Dong Nai. So we saw a lot of uh, land price increase in Dong Nai in the past 12 months, uh, anywhere from 20 to 50%, depending on locations. So I think Dong Nai will be a, a key area for further capital growth moving forward as infrastructure continues to develop and with the development of the, uh, the new airport um, out in uh, Long Tan. For the South, another key area I think um, that would be uh, an area where there will be further opportunity for capital growth and investment will be the Long An area. The Long An province is the, the key uh, province, which is the gateway to the Mekong Delta. So we're seeing a lot of the agri-product, uh, food manufacturing, cold storage, uh, looking at uh, taking additional space uh, in this area due to the supply of uh, fruit, uh, food and vegetables uh, from the Mekong through to the city locations. And as we see continued development on the infrastructure system uh, from especially the Long Tan Expressway, which will actually connect uh, Long An over to uh, Dong Nai area as well, once that's completed. So you'll see that there will be future growth. Another area which um, many people talk about is uh, Gai Mac, which is a seaport in Vung Dao. Uh, we see that developing and there has been a lot of talks that the, the Cat Lai port in District 2 in Ho Chi Minh City will relocate there. But until that really happens, I think that there is still some lag behind for potential capital growth in the Gai Map area in the next 12 months, but we will expect that to have some growth in the next uh, two to three years, more medium term. Um, this is just a little bit about what we do for BW. We're a joint venture between Warburg Pincus and, and Becomex. And to date, we have um, over Five, 420 hectare of land bank already. I think as of uh, this month now, we'll probably be reaching 530 hectare uh, in our portfolio. We, uh, what we try to do is actually we cater to both the Vietnamese uh, companies and also FDI companies looking to set foot in Vietnam, whether it is actually they're looking for a facility. We built ready built factories and warehouses uh, to lease for these companies. So they are able to come in reduce capital costs and, and just basically set shop and, and start uh, production and focus on their core business. Uh, we have a number of locations now, so from north to south, covering all the key uh, provinces that I've mentioned earlier from Bắc Ninh, Hai Phong, Hai Yung, Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, Binh Yung and Dong Nai. Here are some of the facilities that we do offer. So we actually cater for investors that look at small size factory units to build to suit facilities. Uh, on average, we roll out about 400,000 square meters of GFA each year. Uh, in our portfolio, we have over 400,000 already under operation and completed. Uh, we will be building another 300,000, uh, start construction 300,000 this year. And this is mainly to cater for the current demand that we're seeing. Also, one of the things that we've noticed uh, during COVID time is actually local companies are actually really expanding and they're not going the traditional way of buying land and building their facility, but they're coming to us and just renting directly to actually help reduce the burden of the initial capital uh, that they need to set up. 
So, and they will focus on keeping that capital for the operation of the business and also to focus on installing uh, machinery and equipment as well. So this has been a, an alternative solution for existing companies that are looking to expand. Um, in addition to that, in the second half of this year, we've seen our inquiries uh, double uh, compared to our uh, COVID period of March, March and April period. I think um, that's pretty much it for me on the industrial front. I'm happy to take any questions if uh, anybody's, the audience has any questions. I think there was one question right in the zone for you, uh, uh, Ms Chan. So thank you for the presentation. But there was one about uh, which region is um, strong in supply chain for chemical and rubber industry uh, in terms of the industrial zones. I guess there's some that are, you know, closer or more related to that supply chain, chemical and rubber. Do you have any? Chemical and rubber. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in terms of the supply chain, I'd say uh, around the, the Dong Nai uh, province. Okay, not far from Ho Chi Minh City, Dong Nai, huh? Okay, so that was a question from uh, Sam No. So I think uh, Dong Nai is your recommendation, but that's almost 100% occupied, isn't it, Dong Nai? There are some new parks that are being built. Um, Amart is going to do another expansion um, mm. and, and they're moving further further out. Um, it's just going to be a little bit further out of the, in terms of connectivity uh, to mm. the city. So uh, there will be new, new IPs being developed in Dongnai. But that will, I think the issue that we have here now for the new IPs being developed is the land compensation and clearance. So the developers are finding it much more difficult and much more lengthier to complete. So that's why it's also putting a lot of pressure on land prices in, in mm. key provinces, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's slow to, slow to release the uh, new supply. Very good, excellent presentation and thanks so much. I think there's a, a couple more questions we'll try and deal with at the end. Um, also wanted to remind everybody, um, we've opened a poll about uh, uh, the participants, so no, not the panelists, but the participants on this uh, webinar, if they want to vote for which sector they think is the strongest in Vietnam, there's a, a mini poll there that we'll, we'll give the results of by the end of this meeting. Um, but with no, uh, no further delay, because again, we don't want to keep everybody too long, um, I want to introduce uh, Kathleen or Chan Min Tu, who's the legal partner at um, uh, GBS firm in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, her practice is focused on inbound foreign direct investment, corporate law and tax, um, and all the associated issues. And we saw some of those questions coming up in Q&A about foreigners or foreign businesses investing in property, um, which is just another thing on top of everything else to do with property. So that's where the good lawyers come in. So uh, prior to joining the firm, uh, Kathleen worked uh, for years with a Korean firm. Um, so she has a lot of uh, interaction with Korean companies entering the Vietnam market. And uh, uh, Kathleen also continues to advise foreign investors on establishing and operating businesses in Vietnam, not just the property related activity. And she's uh, currently the director of Vic Law Limited, which is a, it's a partner of GBS as well. So uh, Kathleen's going to talk us through some of the, uh, the key points about the investment process. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea, for your introduction. Um, my pleasure to be here to share some information and legal part about the real estate and property. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with some information here. Okay, so I will not repeat uh, all the things that people talked about already. That's just some uh, brief information that I have from the state bank and other authorities about that. Uh, so for statistics of state bank, we have uh, FDI capital and that's what I will focus on is a FDI capital invest in real estate business that continue to range as a third with a total registered capital nearly $3.2 billion. And by the end of June 2020, the scale of real estate capital reached $1.6 billion, accounting for about 
percent of the total outstanding loan of economy, excluding construction loan. And in there, housing debt is about 63%, as the rest is the credit for real estate business. And uh, by the end of August 2020, the equity of listed real estate is mean the real estate enterprise, which is list on the real estate market, reached uh, 397. Thousand billion Vietnam dong. This is reduced two percent due to the early two thousand twenty. And there is some reports I will briefly talk here is from VARS. This is Vietnam Real Estate Brokerage Association. This is in the first nine months of two thousand twenty. There are four thousand new projects of condotel and villa hotel were being published and sold in the market why the transaction volume was not much. Uh, so even most of the major areas in the condotel market have a low number of transactions such as uh, Da Nang, Phu, Quảng Ninh, Bình Thuận. However, they still sold and publish new processes there. And another report from CBRE, that's the average selling price of the whole market in 2020 is expected to increase by 5% over the same period last year. So in summary, we see here a just a general a statistic from State Bank and report uh, from VARS and CBIE. We can see even uh, the most faster real estate B effect is a uh, travel faster, it's called hotel, villa hotel, but for Another real estate activity like house or apartment is still work well. It's not, uh, it's reduced a little bit, but it's not much. And uh, next is a general initial approach about a law. That is my job to tell you uh, what is a legal provision of Vietnam right now for foreign investor in the real estate. So here I would like to separate into uh, two subject, two parts of the entity would say, uh, one is not real estate company, including personal, individual, and organization. And another is a real estate company. Then in order to, for you to understand if you are normal people, not invest in a real estate business, a company, but you can hold which, uh, which house or apartment with type of real estate you can hold. The first one is who can hold house in Vietnam. And then here, uh, I must be, uh, emphasize at the beginning is a foreign individual and organization can own apartment. Uh, own foreign individual and also organization can own apartment, but it have a limit. It's not more than 30% of the home building. And you also can own the house in particular area, also have a limit. It's not more than 250 houses in a world level administrative unit. So in Vietnam, we have a world level, district level, and a city level. And here, if we calculate in the world level administrative unit, that you cannot own more than 250 houses. That is in general for someone who not in real estate business, but you want to buy the house or real estate in Vietnam. Uh, two more notes for this area is you, uh, you need to note if you are individual organization when you own what can you do with the assets. This is a foreign individual. When you buy an assets, you can sell and sublease the assets. This is your, your right. But for foreign organization without real estate activity, you only allow to use assets for employees working at that organization or office, but not for other purposes. This means you buy the assets and is considered at uh, the assets of the company. It's not a real estate assets for buying and sell. So you buy and you use it at the employees working or uh, in office, not for sell, not for sublease. And for sure, later you can sell the assets, but it's like sell assets of the company, not buy and sell usually, and you cannot hold many assets as own. Uh, then we, I go to the next uh, subject is real estate company. 
uh, that is a company who invests in Vietnam for doing real estate business. This means you can buy and sell and supplies. You have full power to do all activity of a real estate company. Then first of all, you need to know the most important condition is the capital, minimum charter capital. It should be 20 billion Vietnam dollars. That is a capital you will register and invest into the bank account of the company, but it's not mean you have to hold that money throughout the time you do business. You can use that money to buy assets, to pay for salary, office, whatever, but make sure all the time, the minimum target capital, you will need to keep at 20 billion Vietnam now. Uh, the second thing you need to note for the house in construction, is mean that the house or apartment uh, will finish in future, is not right now. So before, as you are a developer, before you sell or lease that house in construction, you must be warranted by the qualified commercial bank. So there's have to have a bank who will represent you to war warranty with the buyer about your house or apartment. That is some brief information for initial approval. You, uh, I just let you know about the law of Vietnam. So in case you have any question about that, then maybe I will. Uh, talk more about tax or something else. Thank you for listening. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Kathleen. The, uh, uh, we just uh, covered a lot of territory there, but I think on the legal side, that's really uh, all the main points. I think uh, whether it's as an individual investor or as a uh, corporate investor, um, we just, uh, whilst that, all of the speeches were going on, we were conducting a mini poll about uh, what our participants. Um, so we have over 70 people live on the webinar today and uh, what they're thinking about the hot parts of the, the hottest part of the market. And uh, it's very consistent with what the property market is demonstrating is that the, um, uh, the, the actual uh, industrial sector is really the hot one in Vietnam. And, and I guess that's a global trend with so much business moving to Vietnam. Interestingly, commercial, even though there's a there is a shortage of A-grade commercial in Ho Chi Minh City. It's not as popular because everybody's out uh, watching that space as well. And, and residential still has some support. Everybody loves a nice apartment or a piece of land. So um, uh, thanks to all the, uh, the viewers for, for uh, their participation there. And again, I'll, I'll just uh, um, you know, ask the, uh, our, our panelists just for a few more minutes because there's a couple of questions we haven't been, haven't been able to answer in writing. And I think if we can answer those uh, verbally, probably save everybody a bit of time. Um, particularly, uh, uh, there's a, uh, one about how, um, what's the impact of some of this infrastructure, the metro lines. So very happy if one of our panelists has a point of view on, uh, there's a question from Anthony uh, about uh, how the, uh, uh, how the metro lines that are opening, I guess, in uh, in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City are likely to impact on some of the residential property. And this is obviously not a prediction. It's a crystal ball feeling, I guess. So uh, so maybe, uh, maybe uh, one of our experts could uh, express a point of view. Yeah, hello, um, uh, Ron. Uh, so just uh, in terms of your question, I guess I guess there's a few um, obvious uh, economic things. If if the infrastructure improves and transport improves and opens up an area, um, then there's the potential for an uplift in in land prices or an uplift in terms of uh, or need um, for people to um, uh, buy houses there. You can see in the you know it it, it might not look like it, uh, but in Vietnam there is lots of maps and planning and 2020 plans and 2550 plans and things like that in terms of uh, urban urban um, uh, planning and urban development um, <clears throat> from from uh, from uh, you can see in terms of Ho Chi Minh City on, on the dip, the line one uh, that's going up that there's a movement to the end of that line for a lot of universities a lot of government buildings where they're moving out there um, you know making making that a lot easier so it, it once transport improves, it changes the the the, the type of um, need and the requirement of what's there, and 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 so there's always an uplift in price. 
Uh, we get a lot of foreign investors before um, um, before this year that were looking at developments that are along um, the construction corridors, uh, along uh, MTR lines, because they, they realize that once that's connected, then the, the price of those apartments and rental rates are going to increase um, as well, as, as they have done in other, other countries as well. So uh, to long story short, I think once once you open up an area, it changes the, the usability of that area, and there's there's a percentage for an uplift in price and rental rates for investors. Great, thanks, David. Uh, that's I think that's as bad a specific an answer as anybody can give at this point. I mean, next we'll have to work out when these things are opening, and that's another crystal ball question. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely, uh, some of us are already invested. Uh, maybe a couple of years ago, next to the railway line. Um, moving on to another question, um, uh, one for Ms. Chan is uh, the uh, what products or industries are moving into the ready-built factories? Is it electronics or furniture? Maybe we can answer that one live. Okay, um, we are seeing a number of different sectors. Uh, one of the most interesting one that we've seen and by a local company is actually medical equipment. So masks, the medical gloves, the production of that. Um, that actually is, uh, mm -hmm. is um, tech and electronics is mainly just parts uh, that supply um, to the big queen beast like the Samsungs or the Intels. Um, and then also what we're seeing is furniture, not so much. Um, most of the furniture production already have the bigger facilities. Um, we see more uh, molding, uh, molding, uh, where they're doing casts and providing mold uh, for, for uh, parts. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ms. Chan. Okay, uh, a couple more, I think, before we wrap it up. Uh, the Talking about industrial real estate, uh, development of Buk Ning as a major hub for factories outside of Hanoi, is it a reasonable suitable investment for residential and commercial real estate, because, you know, there's going to be an urban centre. If I gra grasp that question correctly, you know, if there's sufficient industrial development, does that mean that the residential and commercial real estate will also come along in Buckingham? I, I would expect that this will happen. We already seeing uh, Vin Hood Group already doing a big township out that way in Buckingham as well, with high rise apartments, and they've been selling quite well. Uh, we will see that residential crisis in, in uh, close to the industrial park area will develop. The infrastructure development in Buckingham has also been very good in terms of connectivity. It's uh, very accessible to Hanoi. So I would expect that in the next uh, 24 months, this, this, you'll see significant capital growth in those uh, two areas. Wow, fantastic. That's a good question too. So thanks for the question. I think, uh, I think the final question that we haven't answered yet, uh, and then I'll pass my huge thanks to such an expert panel, is the current market price for a square metre in Long An, Binzung and Dong Nai, because it's obviously moved a lot. Um, is, there a, is there a feel for what's the, I guess it's industrial land we're talking about here, because there's a lot of residential and other types of land out there, but I'm assuming uh, the question from Martin, that uh, it's comparing the different uh, price per square, sure, yeah. yeah, price per square metre for the industrial land in Long An, Binzung, and Dong Nai, so surrounding Ho Chi Minh City. Um, if it's industrial land, I would know, but I wouldn't know. Yes, too much. yes, it is. <laughs> Martin has clarified it's industrial. Yeah. Okay, so industrial, um, Binyung. Uh, if you're closer to the VSIP one and Ho Chi Minh City area, you're looking at VSIPs already over. $250 per square metre and the Samutan area. Uh, if you move further north of Binyung, you're looking at around anywhere from $120 to $80, uh, depending on how far you, you've moved further away from the CBD of Binyung. Uh, Long An, uh, prices are ranging from $180 uh, further out of Long An to closer areas like um, Long Hao, which is close to Hip Phuc area. We're looking at about close to $200 per square metre. Um, all these prices will also have a certain variation depending on the land status, if it's upfront or annual payment. So I think investors need to be conscious of that as well when they're looking at the price. Uh, Dong Nai area, 
we're seeing ranges from $80 to $150. Uh, $150 will be closer to the Nyanchak area, which is closer to uh, District 9 in Ho Chi Minh City. When you get further out of Dong Nai, you're looking at around the $80 to $90 mark. Couldn't get more specific than that. That's gold. Thank you, Ms. Town. So um, I think uh, the other questions uh, we'll answer via the, the, um, the Q&A box. So uh, uh, I've asked too much of my experts today and uh, I've got to say uh, uh, it's been a very well attended event and um, it's a, I think maybe the most impressive property panel that we could have assembled. So uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to our speakers today. Uh, to Ken for opening it up and uh, apologies for all the technical no, no, headaches. No. Um, <laughs> we did our best. And uh, to David, to Miss Jan and to Kathleen uh, for all of your insights. I think, uh, you know, again, it's uh, perfectly fine for anybody on this webinar to uh, either contact uh, the speakers uh, directly or to, to me via email uh, with any follow-up thoughts. And, um, and again, uh, subject to any confidentiality concerns, um, we'll try and share the, uh, the presentations, um, so maybe the panellists might want to edit it or refine it um, before that's shared, but we've had a few of our, our uh, participants uh, ask for some of those presentations because, uh, uh, you know, it's really right on the mark in terms of the current conditions. So once again, thanks to all of our experts and um, also to all the participants. And, you know, again, stay tuned for the next Inside Out webinar. Um, hopefully it can be as... Uh, as well uh, presented as this this one today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.